Welcome to the Prosperous Empath Podcast, designed especially for empaths and highly sensitive entrepreneurs just like you who are committed to achieving holistic success. I'm your host, Katherine Wood, Master Certified Coach, Author, Mastermind Leader, and Founder of Unbounded Potential, a boutique coaching firm for empathic entrepreneurs. I'm on a mission to bring empathy back into the world of business. Each episode will focus on achieving more by doing less through leveraging empath-friendly leadership practices, boundaries, rituals, and systems, all the while continuing to care deeply about ourselves, others, and the world around us. If you are committed to joyful living and running a conscious business, but amassing wealth while doing so, proving that you can have both in a society that tells you you can't, then you are in the right place. Join me here each week to find out how. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review so you won't miss an episode. Plus, you'll find all the show notes and helpful resources over at unbounded-potential.com. Hi, Erin. Welcome to the podcast. I am so thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you. Well, I'd love to maybe just jump in. Maybe you could share your pronouns and... Maybe just kick us off with a little bit of your story. Like even, I know we've only been connected for a little while, so I'm hearing, interested to hear more of it myself. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Um, so my pronouns are she, her, and um, my story really started back in my days of an, being a marketing director at a small nonprofit. So at this nonprofit, we brought New York Times bestselling writers to speak to audiences of 600 to 1600. And I got to work with some amazing, amazing authors, everybody from Elizabeth Gilbert to Margaret Atwood and 125 others. I mean, it was a really, really cool career. Um, but when my um, my mentor, the, the woman I had gone really to work for at this nonprofit, I really wanted to learn from her and work from her with her, she retired. And they passed me over for director because I was too young. So the new person who came in, I knew I had another 10 years to sit around and wait to see if I was ever going to be able to get that spot. And I decided to take a chance and start my own business. Um, And that was in 2015. So I've been around for a a while. I mean, there's certainly people who have been around longer than me, but I sometimes feel like a dinosaur on the internet. And uh, I absolutely love what I do. I love being able to have my own business, work with my own clients, choose the the people who really vibe and and work with me well. And so I've done a lot of different things, everything from marketing and sales to backend operations and COO work and just a lot, a lot of variation in the time that I've been online. But it's been so fun to use the skills, use everything that I've I gained in that nonprofit world to be able to help creative entrepreneurs. It's been pretty fun. What are some of your favorite skills that you took from the nonprofit world into entrepreneurship? A level, my my top one is the level of ability I had to have to be able to pivot on a dime when we were running an event. I mean, we would have, uh, we, we worked in this historic music hall, Carnegie Music Hall in Pittsburgh. And it was a three-story marble floor music hall. Mm. Uh, And there would be times when I was literally running up and down these flights of stairs to get to where the thing was needed. Um, But it, it, this level of resilience and just being able to adjust, pivot in the moment, that's not working. Author's not happy. Something happened with the speaker system. Like we just had to be so quick on our feet. Um, And so it's, it's taught me so much around when we're inside of our businesses, especially in the creative entrepreneurial world, like we can, we can think we have the luxury of being able to pause and stop and think because so infrequently is it such an emergency that we need an immediate response. So I loved being in a world where I needed to be able to make those immediate responses. Cause I feel that uh, connection to my clients that are like, what do I say to this person? How do I respond? It's like the the grace that we get to be able to just pause mm-hmm. and think. And that's been a huge gift to see that contrast. I love the evidence of contrast. What does that mean? The evidence? What do you mean by that? The evidence of contrast? I, I look for, I call it that. I mean, I don't know if it's really, but anytime I can look at situations and I can look at 
A and B and see how incredibly different they are and the journey that had to happen for me to get from A to B. Um, the just, I mean, silly things like we've recently moved to Florida and just the way that the weather affects me. I think about this time of year and where we would be in Pennsylvania and what would be happening in Pennsylvania and, and just having that contrast um, and being able to witness that and and see how far I've come as, a re, as it relates to, to change. So I just something I like to look at. <laughs> I mean, I hear I hear a theme of adaptability, mm-hmm. and that's I think, my whole life, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's Feels my like whole that's, life. that's the entrepreneur's life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's been a just a very very cool adventure. Well, something that's fun that I hear you speaking about, and you've said it now a couple times, is like the idea of being a creative entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. and you're a business coach, right? So mm-hmm. like, I think many mm-hmm. business coaches wouldn't necessarily self-identify or self-proclaim themselves as a creative entrepreneur, but you do. And so I wonder, you know, how how do you see yourself as a creative entrepreneur and how has that been a part of your journey? Sure. Um, well, I like to take it apart. So for me, when I think about entrepreneurship, I define it as somebody who is willing to take a less than typical financial risk. And you can ask my husband the number of times I've bet the rent or the mortgage (laughs) on the big idea, the thing that's going to work. I'm really willing to, and in most cases, it's betting on myself. Um, So I have that entrepreneurship piece, but the creative piece, it, it comes for me. And I'm not necessarily pushing the pixels or, or, you know, coding the website like my clients are, but I don't have formal business training. I have real life business training. I have those in the trenches running a small nonprofit business training. And so my creativity comes from the fact that I don't have formulas or frameworks or it has to be done this way for my clients to follow. I am creative in how I design every single business every single client, because I'm thinking about what's actually going to work for them. What are their skills? What's their experience? What are their goals? What do they care about? And how do we meld and mesh their business together in such a way that we truly get to the outcome that they're looking for? And if I had to go buy the book, I I, I wouldn't be able to do it. My ability to be able to literally make stuff up as, a, as we go along, right? It's, it's the building the plane as we fly it. With every business that I'm working with, um, that's where the creativity comes in for me. Coming up with a new idea or a different way of thinking about it or so you don't want to do Facebook. Okay, well, let's think of a different way we can do this. How can we get to the same outcome? And I think there are a lot of business coaches online and they're amazing at what they do, but they do have that rigidity of a formula or a framework, or these are the steps that we follow in this order. And I never fit with that. I just, it never worked for me and it's never worked for the, the clients I've worked with. So that's where I bring that creativity into the uh, <laughs> the risk piece. <laughs> well, I I love that you answered it that way because, you know, I... I work with business owners also, but I take a different approach than you, which I know we chatted about when we last talked. Like I come from this purely mindset or ontological perspective, right? Ontology Mm -hmm. is the study of being. And so when I look at business problems, like I'm, or even breakdowns, really, I don't even use the word problem. (laughs) We look at who someone is being and whether they're bringing a creative consciousness or a a victim consciousness. And- Um, and, and so I love like that reminder that, you know, when we are being a creator, when we're bringing a creative mindset, we're, we're focused on solutions. We're focused on forward momentum, forward action. So we're really kind of being in the exploration of, you know, the path forward versus focusing on what's not working. And so Mm -hmm. I hear, um, I just hear a kind of a similarity in our approaches. I think we have a lot in common in the way that we work, even though we're coming from from different angles as we're looking at business. You're, I'm, I'm glad that there are people like you who are able to approach from more of that mindset being direction. That's so not my strength, and so being able to have those, and that's really how I've how I've built my business. I find all of the mentors, coaches who 
who bring together this combination of support. So having a mindset coach and having somebody who's looking at strategy um, and the different ways that they interplay, I think that's critical for our clients to be able to, to find the match of putting that support team together. I used to joke that even my person who cuts my hair is on my support team, but it really, I think back to some of the best years of my business and it was, I had a strategy and a mindset coach, two different people, and they were totally in lockstep. And that's Mm -hmm. what I loved about that, that synergy of working with another, another coach in addition. That's very cool. Well, I want to shift gears there because, um, I know that you do a lot of work with your clients with the Kobe assessment and Mm -hmm. that's not my specialty at all. Like I don't use any assessments in my coaching. It's so much more holistic. And Mm -hmm. so I would love to hear more about, um, how you incorporate the Kobe assessment into Mm -hmm. your work, how you kind of chose that path as something you were interested in getting certified in. Like, I'm so curious. Yeah. Yeah. So I love, I love the Colby. Uh, the, the primary tool is the Colby A index. And the reason that I love it is because it brings me a reliability and a predictability about how each business owner is uniquely wired to be in the world as a business owner. Um, from a cognitive perspective. So when we're looking at the mind, we have our cognitive or our skills, what we can do. We have our effective or our personality, things that we want to do. And then we have this third and and much less explored piece of cognitive or what you will do. So I like to define it for my clients and when when I'm working with people who aren't familiar with it, it's how you take action and make decisions. And so when I receive someone's um, results from them taking the index, right, I'll have four numbers and those four numbers for me, because I'm certified and I have had a lot of experience with it, I know how they're wired. And if they're free to be themselves, I know what they're going to do. There's a level of predictability when we approach a certain kind of problem in business. And I can say with relative certainty how they're going to take action, how they're going to think through that problem. And sometimes they, um, uh, there are times when somebody has been so out of being themselves and doing things their way that they will resist the way that they're wired uniquely. Um, and when we can find that, uh, that realignment with who they're, who they are and how they, they naturally make these decisions, it helps business work better. Um, so it, for me, it's almost like a, like a secret code. Um, Somebody tells me their Colby score and I instantly know how to talk to them and work with them. Um, I can mediate through challenges before they even happen because I already know they're going to happen. It's, it's just such a superpower tool for me as a, as a business coach, coach consultant that um, I, I had to get certified (laughs) to have the software. I had to have it be something I relied upon and used. So it's been, it's it's really amazing for me. When you got first uh, certified, did you, I'm curious, like what were some of your personal ahas? Like in, were there areas of your business where you noticed you were operating out of alignment with your own score? Yes. And so it's funny because I first learned about the Colby from my business coach way back in 2016. And she had me take the assessment before she would do her intensive with me. It was like our first experience working together, um, a three hour intensive. And she wanted me to take this, this assessment. And I would have done anything. She, I would have gone to the moon if she'd asked me to at that point. And so I take the assessment and it comes back that I initiate in the mode of quick start. But we don't have to go super down the, the rabbit hole of Colby to know that I am somebody who is naturally designed to take risks. I mean, I am, I am really <laughs> cool with risk and uncertainty and with, um, and so what was happening in my business at the time is I was trying to plan with a level of rigidity and a level of sometimes complexity that my programs were too heavy. They just had too much in them. They were too, um, uh, just hard to execute because they were loaded with stuff. You know, there was modules and there was this, and like, it was just too heavy. 
And I remember her saying, you're a quick start. You need to stay lean and you need to be able to quickly test and change. So let's put some offers out in the world. Try some things before you go building out this whole ecosystem. You don't know if it's going to sell yet. You don't know if people are going to resonate with it or they're going to want to buy it from you. So let's skip all the planning and do a little bit of just imperfect action taking. It changed the entire way I run my business. I love that. I mean, I, so so I, there's a part of me with my coach background that, that has a distaste in my mouth for assessments because it's like the idea of some external force, uh, assessing who you are, how you operate. Mm -hmm. And then there's this other part of me that also understands that when some assessment or person or test can, can speak clearly to who we are, it can help it can help see ourselves in a new way. So I am an empath, a highly sensitive person and an introvert. And, you know, I think there, there are some great personality tests to distinguish for each of those sure. traits, right? The highly sensitive person quiz in Elaine Aaron's book, The Highly Sensitive Person and um, the introvert quiz in Susan Cain's book, Quiet. And, mm-hmm. and for me, like, um, and most recently I just, I'm just reading, I think it's the empaths survival guide and there's a, Mm -hmm. an empath quiz in there. And, and I have to, I have to say that a part of me is kind of falling for these assessments more because Mm -hmm. I think that it, to a degree, it does allow you to be you more easily. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. it allows you to embrace parts of yourself that you may, previously have rejected or tried to stuff. Sure. Yeah. I I love the way you're thinking about this. And when I when I think about effective personality tests or assessments, right? So the effective part of the mind is one that changes. It is constantly evolving and changing and becoming the next version of itself. So we think about how we interact with a new group of people. And suddenly we have these little things that we, we new interest might emerge or um, even like patterns of speech. When you start to hang out with different people, what you're reading, the interactions that people have, um, that personality continues to evolve as you grow and change. The thing that's different for me with Conation is it is, it is so reliable and it doesn't change. So we've done 20 year studies with it and somebody takes the test and 20 years later, they get the same score. And what I, that's the reliability for me in business that I love. And I love effective personality tests for uh, getting to know ourselves better and watching the evolving and the changing as we um as we grow as humans, I think that's amazing. So I think there's a place for both. And certainly that not a test doesn't define who you are. (laughs) It just gives Mm -hmm. you some signals and clues of who you might be. Yeah. Or in my experience, it gives you permission to own who you are. Mm -hmm. I love that. Will you define cognation for me? (laughs) So cognation or volition. um, And it's all about what you will do. So it's a pretty old word. um, And Kathy Colby, the founder of Colby, um, discovered it doing research. So her father was the creator of the Wonderlust uh, cognitive, like skills-based assessment. When she was a little girl, she remembered him telling her that there's more. He said, "I, I know there's more, go do the research, go figure it out, go find the more. Um, and she, in her studies discovered this, this word, this old word, um, conation or volition. And that's what she built her research and really her life's work. It's 40 plus years of she's in her eighties now. Um, she continues to tweak it, which drives the the certified consultants a little crazy, but it's also, (laughs) she's a living theorist and she's watching it evolve as, as time goes on. So it's pretty fun. That's cool. And Mm -hmm. I love that there's that, um, generational kind of passing down of knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also one of the reasons why Colby's not well marketed because she watched her dad's test get spliced in 27 different directions and appropriated here and there. There wasn't enough protection around his work. And so she, there's a pretty strict contract that we sign around how we're able to talk about it 
um, what kind of marketing we're able to do around it. But she really has protected it. Unlike something like a Myers-Briggs, which, you know, you have 16 personalities that has sort of um, joined, there's a different way of taking it, but it's the same information, right? So she didn't want that to happen. And her is, test is the only test um, on, that measures conation that exists. So she's protected it sometimes to her, to, to everybody's detriment sometimes, because that marketing engine never really gets going from the the consultants themselves. Mm -hmm. So does, does Kobe, is that the, the primary goal of Kobe that it tests for volition or are there other personality traits that it's testing for? Nope. That's all it does. It just tests for, <laughs> for that volition piece. And so sometimes, and I'm not particularly involved in this piece, but Kathy has gone uh, into career because of that connection with her dad and the whole cognitive of what you can do, those skills that you have, she's got a lot of real interest in helping people choose careers based on their cognition. So their cognitive style informs the career they choose um, and to get people to work more in harmony with their natural tendencies and how they're wired to be. So that's kind of an interesting path. I haven't really gone down because I don't do a lot of career exploration uh, usually people are coming to me with, with a business and they're pretty sad on where they're headed, but it's a neat, a neat, uh, river that she's gone down. How many, so now I'm so curious. So how, what is, how many, like when you, when you get a score, like how many different paths are there sure. or styles? Yeah. Yep. So there are four columns that represent a continuum or a range of possible numbers. So, so typically when we see one to 10, we go one is bad and 10 is amazing, right? In this case, those numbers only show where you land on a continuum um, of strengths. So there are four columns and each column has three strengths. So there's a combination of 12 strengths that any, the combination of, of columns. So for me, I'm a four, four, eight, three. So on that one to one to 10 scale, I land in the middle on the first two. I end up at the eight. So I'm at the high end of the range for the third column. And that's how I initiate your highest number is typically your initiation. And then the final three is they all, but they're corresponding with strengths, not good or bad. Right? So when we're working with particular combinations, anywhere from one to 10 in four columns is where your potential score could, could land. Sounds a little bit like a, um, like a formula. <laughs> a little bit. And it's true because once you can code a test um, and you know what the numbers mean and you know what strengths they correspond with, it, it literally feels like that locker combination, right? When you're just sort of clicking yeah. in, it all falls into place. Um, and it, the, it is challenging to teach it because the numbers mean different things and they go in different orders. So you really do have to find a consultant who knows what they're, what they're talking about in order to, to understand yourself better when it comes to those numbers, but that's how it starts hmm. with four numbers. So how do you, so I'm curious, like when you're working with a client, with a mm -hmm. client engagement, like how mm -hmm. does the Kobe, um, how does that play into your work with clients? Yeah. So I had a, a gal who had a, her score was a seven, three, seven, three. And what that told me is that what she liked to do was gather tons and tons and tons and tons of information in her business. She would research and then she would go and start something. She would go and start to take action on something, but very quickly get distracted by the next new interest, research interest. And so instead of putting things out in the world and letting people buy from her. She would have a good idea and then she'd go back into research mode and she would spend so much time stuck in research mode that she was never really willing to go and take action on those ideas because she'd have the next idea to research. So we, it felt like a seesaw, right? That she was always either in the, we should do this great new idea. And then she'd go to research mode and she would never launch it. She would never execute. So once we realized that for her, we could, we created some systems around how she was researching, what she was re researching. We used team to support some of that, to, to take some of the research impulse um, and and reassign that. We also ask different questions like, okay, do you have enough information to make a decision? And, and that's really key for somebody like her. 
you know, making, making real certain that, okay, you know what you want, you know, all there is to know about this particular topic. Now let's go and take some action. And so people would, um, with that kind of seesaw energy, they get really frustrated because they feel like they're doing all this activity and they're doing all this work, but nothing ever launches. And they don't understand why, because they want to go with the next new idea and put it out in the world. So um, that was like just one specific example of, of what we were working with, with a score. Yeah, that's fun. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm imagining like, so you have a client, you help them develop their score, or it, it could be any assessment, right? Because there's so many out there. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like, how do you, how, like, what is your experience with your clients of being willing to implement what they discover? Because I think sometimes we can get really set in our ways around how we do things, how we approach business, how we approach marketing or sales or developing a new program or plan. Yeah, I've found that the they when they first learn their numbers, they first get their their results back and they learn their numbers. When I can explain them to themselves, there's a level of trust that is built so quickly because it's immediately, oh my gosh, you get me. Okay, so based on the fact that I understand not only who you're wired to be, but where you're stuck, now we get into that creative space, like I was talking about earlier, of trying to find the path forward that's gonna work for them based on their unique strengths. So somebody who really has an aversion to um, putting things out before they're perfect, right? They, every single piece of it's got to be perfect. So I will find these many opportunities for us to test just one aspect of it. And I can convince them that that's a great path forward because we can perfect one little thing. We can test it and it informs our next step. So we, we just, we sort of work with what works for them and find ways to modify so when it when it's completely custom, you don't get the level of pushback on it. At least I haven't, um, because it it's all for their best and their highest and good when they see the way they're wired versus the way they're operating their business. When we can get that into sync, then stuff starts to work and money starts to flow and clients start to show up and all the things that they wanted, all because we make those little tweaks. So it's um it's been incredibly well received for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a couple of important lessons in that because first of all, I hear just the reminder that like when someone feels fully seen, seen in who they are and how they operate and how they get in their own way, like they're, that, that there's more immediately more trust mm -hmm. um, and rapport built. And then secondly, like, um, you know, everyone wants small wins. Like everyone wants to create winnable games with their clients so that they can start to see the impact of their work together. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really, it also supports in building trust. Yeah. That's exactly what I think is the secret for me to why it's worked because on paper, people used to look at my business. I remember I went to this conference and I don't know why revenue at the time was relevant in the framing of the conversation, but I shared my revenue number. And afterwards, one of the presenters pulled me aside and didn't believe me. And he asked me, he's like, how are you this profitable? How do you have this much revenue? It's just you. Like, how are you doing that? And I sort of shared the behind the scenes of how I built my business. It's literally built around exactly what I'm really good at and what I'm not so great at. Guess what? I don't do it. Or I will hire a contractor. Counting, not really my thing. Books, <laughs> I got a person for that, right? Like I'm never going to do that. Don't do the things you suck at. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. So I can cut my own hair. I shouldn't. Um, so these are the things that when I look at, at why my clients have succeeded, it's, it goes back to that idea. I just don't know what the rules are. I don't know what the formulas and the foundations and the way you're supposed to do. I don't know any of that stuff. So it doesn't get in my way when I'm helping them find that unique path forward because I'm not bound by any of those of those traditional ways of doing things. Yeah, I mean, totally, right? Like it's a completely client-centric, strengths-based approach. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Well, this has been interesting. I, I find myself getting even more curious. I think I need to get <laughs> assessed on the COVID yeah. now. <laughs> it's a it's a simple uh, a simple assessment and what you uncover, you know, and the thing that I like about Colby beyond just business is it's applicable in life. So silly example that I have permission to share. My husband is um, what's known as an implementer um, in Colby. And the way that that manifested for us in our relationship is that he would not sit at a table and have a conversation with me. He was always pacing around the room. I'm talking to him and he's going on unloading the dishwasher. And I'm like, are you, can you just please pay attention to me? And he's like, no, 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 wait, I'm paying attention. And I'm like, no, you aren't paying attention. We would have that, that little squabble back and forth about, I didn't feel like he was paying attention to me. Come to find out his implementer is so high that he actually processes and engages in the conversation via physical interaction with his environment. So when he is unloading the dishwasher, he is listening to me. That is how he processes information. It just so happened his career landed him in a place where he's using his hands and implement, interacting with implements, with tools to create the value he does in the world. But we didn't know that until he took the Colby. We just thought our communication was off or we just like didn't know how to talk to each other. or I was too, whatever. As soon as we learned his numbers and put them against mine, we solved 90% of our, of our relationship communication challenges. Um, it was, it was, that's the reason I love it because there's little things that can change somebody's life. You never know what a, what an assessment like that could do if somebody is really struggling in a particular area of their life. So that's why I love it. <laughs> I mean, that's powerful. Mm-hmm. That's a, such a powerful takeaway of how the, um, I mean, it's so true, right? It's like the, the, professional impacts the personal in mm-hmm. in every way that we both see and don't yet see. <laughs> yeah. So true. So true. Well, I know, I mean, I know that you work with a lot of introverts and do you identify as an empath? I think I feel like we talked about this on our last um, call. I do. And you know, you our conversation, our our previous conversation has really challenged me to notice in more places and ways where I actually have that, especially the HSP piece. Um, and so I would say yes, although it was never brought to my attention. So I never really owned it or knew it. It wasn't something that I had fully embraced, but when I think about everything I've learned from you, I go, Hmm, absolutely. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I definitely am. Well, that's so great. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, It's fun. And I guess, um, the reason I ask is because I'm curious what, uh, what you've noticed differently with some of your clients who who identify as sensitive introverts mm-hmm. or empaths and how you how you perceive working with them differently. Mm-hmm. I think that that combination of of empathy, that the highly sensitive, the introversion, depending on how they've come together in combination, will tell me why the creative, has left the corporate world or whatever company, you know, whatever version of corporate. So the corporate world is not built for these kinds of creative people who they just, they don't feel like they fit. And and so for many of my clients, they worked at a creative agency or they worked in a creative job inside of a corporation and they have no they have to be a corporate dropout. They just don't know how to stay in that world and take care of themselves and be good and healthy in that space. And so they take the risk to go out on their own, but they don't, they don't ever look at it and think, I know what I'm doing. I'm starting a business. They don't think that they think I'm going to try freelancing because I just can't take this anymore. I can't continue to be in these environments. I can't continue to be treated these ways um, that are so high harmful for them. And so they go on that entrepreneurial journey and think I can just do some freelance and I'll earn as much doing some projects as I did at my corporate job. And I'll sort of figure it all out. Right. And oftentimes they show up on my doorstep when things are working really like better than they knew that they could work. And that's when it's, I think I accidentally started a business and it works for them because they call the shots they control their environment. They control the clients they work with. They get to have that that strong level of autonomy over their day-to-day. And so 
it matches for all of those pieces of who they are. And where they get stuck is that the sales piece and the marketing piece is sometimes not well aligned with being introverted, right? So if I ask an introvert to go to a networking event, they're going to be like, do I have to, right? And um, so it's it's finding ways for the sales and marketing pieces to work for someone who is an introvert or who is an HSP and finding the systems and support they need around that so they can feel like themselves as they're going out and building a business. Um, so I think... I think maybe it was because I didn't know I was one that it works <laughs> that they come to me because mm-hmm. I have this very practical real life type of way to look at stuff, but then I can bring that level of sensitivity um, to their experiences because I am one. So it, it was a really interesting shift in my overall perspective uh, for how I choose to run my business for sure. Well, I'm just thinking of some of your clients because I've had it. I've already had a couple on the podcast, which is, which is always fun. Like when I feel like the more I podcast, the more kind of like my circles become smaller and, oh, this person knows this person and this sure. person knows this person. And, yeah. and so I've had both Morgan Specht and Sadie Prestridge on the podcast yeah. who are both former clients of yours. Yes. And I'm, and, and, dear even, friends. <laughs> dear and I'm friends. thinking about some of their entrepreneurial journeys and, and their origin stories. And they're, they're similar to what you're sharing. Like this, this idea of being an accidental entrepreneur of not fitting in in corporate and just needing to go off on their own. Yeah. My ideal client is Morgan Speck. So everything I do, (laughs) everything I create, I create for her as a real live. She came to me with, I think I accidentally started a business. Um, And everything that we did over there, I think about four years that we worked together and just watching her trajectory and seeing what she was able to create. She is how I have built every single piece and continue. I've actually hired her to do my branding um, for this next iteration of where I want to go with my business. Um, she's who I think about. Um, and and Sadie, oh gosh, Sadie Prestridge, that girl. Um, she's an absolutely amazing business owner. And I think, I'm not sure we debate, did I learn more from her? Did she learn more from me? She, I really, she was the challenge, the most challenging client I ever worked with because she just pushed and grew and, and went to the next level. And she was doing it so fast that it really, um, it, it really called me to stretch into being Uh the best person for her. Um, and we, it was, they're great. I adore them both. Oh, I love that you share that. So I have, I have a client, a former client and dear friend, just like that. And she's been on the podcast. Also, Liz Rohr um, has a, a, a nurse practitioner course for new nurse practitioners. And I, I also wonder, you know, like who stretched the other more mm-hmm. and, um, and it's so cool. Like, I think as, as empath entrepreneurs, you know, we, we, we are just natural relationship builders and we maintain relationships. Right. And so having that, that person who can really be your ideal client avatar and you, and you just know them on so many levels, (laughs) it just makes the process of, am I communicating effectively so much easier because you just know the person so deeply. (laughs) Yes, it is. It has been a really cool gift. Uh, those relations, that's the thing I'm, I value more than anything is the relationships. And I've, I've been lucky enough to maintain so many of them and that, um, I was never a big famous business coach. I never really aspired to be. And then as I've had recent experiences and gotten behind the scenes of some of those businesses, um, I, I know who I am and I am so glad that I didn't achieve all those things that I thought I wanted, because when you got to the inside, the behind the scenes of it, yeah, I actually didn't want that at all. Um, but it was relationships like ones with Morgan and with Sadie that really have kept me grounded and coming back to who I really am. So it was on a Morgan's encouragement. She's like, why, why, why can't you say I work with website designers, graphic designers, and branding uh, professional creatives. Like, why can't you make it that narrow? That's what you do. (laughs) That's who we all are. That's how we've all come to, to be in your world. And and she just encouraged me to own that space. Um, so it was just, it's been a really cool journey. 
great relationship over so many years. And honestly, I feel like that really speaks to the heart of being an empath entrepreneur, because while we are supporting and standing for our clients to thrive, we are also allowing ourselves to be contributed to. We are allowing the two ways of relationship to work, which deepens trust and rapport. And I'm I'm just like chuckling over here because the reason I started my podcast is because Liz and another former client. Now, one of my best friends and bridesmaids, like at my wedding, we're like, we need to hear your voice. Like you have to do this, you know? And, um, and you were asking me about how my new program launch went Mm -hmm. before we hit record. And next month I'm hosting a, uh, a retreat for my mastermind. Oh my gosh. It is something that, uh, has been a long time in the works. When mm-hmm. I launched the mastermind in 2020, we were going to host a retreat that first year. Yeah, and then we all? <laughs> it got indefinitely paused. And that same year I closed the doors of my second business, which mm-hmm. was a international retreat company. And it was, um, it was a really hard time for me because I ended the partnership with my business partner for that sure. retreats company. And, Um, it was also the end of our friendship and Mm. there was so much grief to process there, but it was truly a result of my masterminders who've become Mm. friends over now these four years later being like, Kat, we want this. Like you create community. We want the retreat. Do it. When are we doing it? And now we're doing it next month. And honestly, it, it wouldn't be otherwise, if it hadn't been for their like calling me forth. Yeah. Thrilled for you. That's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) So that's the beauty of having the ability to be selective about who we work with and how our messaging can be out in the world and attract the people that we most want to, to have around us. I, I say all the time, if I don't want to have dinner with a client, if I can't imagine having them around that mastermind dinner table, then they're not right for my group. Yeah. Um, And that has been that guiding touchstone for me of knowing what it feels like when it's a well-aligned group of people um, and the messaging and the vibe attracts your tribe, I guess they say that. (laughs) And why it is also a necessity in particular for empaths to only work with clients who they would have loved to have dinner with or go on a trip with or take a walk with because our energy is our power, right? Like it's where our our strengths come from. And so if we are giving our energy away to clients who aren't ideal fits, then they are taking so much more from us than, than contributing and consequently taking away from the rest of our clients. Agreed. And that's the part that I didn't, I didn't know that part about being an empath. Mm. I just knew there were certain clients that I was able to serve better and that felt more fun to be connected to. And I always, the, the sales conversations that flow and don't feel like sales conversations are the ones where it's always the right fit. And the ones that I've got to just slog through and there's 27 objections and I'm just trying to work to get them. Don't you see where you could go if you just invest in yourself? And those are the challenges. Those are the ones where I look back and go, why did I do that? It it wasn't, it doesn't end up being to their highest good or mine. Mm-hmm. And I can always feel the resistance as I go through the process. And so now I understand what that is, but I didn't have a word for it before. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's been such a blessing in my business. Like just truly surrendering to that. If a client is not a hell yes, if I don't feel a hell yes desire to work with them, then they are a no. And I can bless and release them or hand them off to someone who I think would be a good fit. Right. Absolutely. It's been a game changer. It's honestly like those no's, like they, they contribute energy to me because I know I'm making a decision for both my and their highest and best. Agreed. Yeah. That's, that is definitely, that is a new standard as I've come back to my business and refocused in on who I want to work with. Um, that is a, that is definitely a new standard that I hold. Um, I had periods of time where I would say, yes, if they wanted to work with me and they had the money to pay me, I would say yes. And I had to learn how detrimental that is on lots of different levels before I finally said enough, I'm not doing that anymore. Mm-hmm. 
Mm, I'm happy for you. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been lovely. I've learned a lot. And honestly, Erin, I um, I really appreciate talking about the Kobe. I wasn't sure where we were going to go in our conversation yeah. today. And and I learned a lot and it it really makes sense. So I, I love that. I, I appreciate you educating me and and my audience because I think sure. it's a fun, it's a fun little tool. It's not the answer to, you know, secret to life or anything. <laughs> it definitely, <laughs> definitely is something I enjoy talking about. So thanks for asking me about it. Yeah, totally. Well, as we wrap, I ask this of all of my guests, mm-hmm. what what supported you in becoming a prosperous empath? People like Sadie Prestridge and Morgan Specht. It's been the people. It's been the amazing clients that I've had um, over the years and watching when the resonance, there was just this resonance with these amazing women. And they're the ones who pushed me to my next level every single time and encouraged me to my next level. And so that is absolutely, it's been the people I've worked with. Yeah, love it. Well, thank you so much for today. This has been such a delight. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved being here. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of the Prosperous Empath Podcast with me, Katherine Wood. Make sure you subscribe and leave a review so you don't miss an episode And so more empaths just like you and me can find the show. As a thank you, each month, one lucky reviewer will receive a 60-minute coaching session with a member of our Unbounded Potential team. You can find all the show notes and bonus resources over at unbounded-potential.com. Thank you so much for listening and locking arms with me to bring empathy and prosperity back into the world of business.